to remind or to re-emphasize what I started with, um, uh, our goal, perhaps, and the lessons from the past would be to try and harness um, our politics to find the least, uh, the points of least resistance, in order to create experiments, um, mechanisms, and systems in order to generate resources for infrastructure development for the cities. So we can do it through land that already is owned by different state entities. We can do it by taxing at the point of change of land use. We can use it through a more intelligent design and greater allocation of public finances that for good political reasons are being deployed in urbanizing, uh, urbanizing areas. And if I think, and I believe that if we are able to get that uh, car rolling, or that bus rolling, um, then a lot of the other things uh, uh, will follow. Uh, we will be able to have uh, much greater success over time in developing the general revenue basis um, for increasingly prosperous urbanizing parts of the country. Thank you for those four or five very specific suggestions. Now I'll invite Mr. Sanjay Sridhar, his strategy head, Embark India. Uh, thank you, Vishay, for having me here. And, and let me first say I'm not an economist and I'm not a doctorate. Older, so I think I need to go to a doctor at the end of this session because I think I've heard some some fascinating ideas on on uh, on metropolitan finance. But but looking at it, I mean, having a background in architecture, planning, and public policy, uh, I'm looking at it from slightly different perspective. Uh, so I'm going to try and uh, uh, I'll try and keep my my uh, presentation not a presentation, just a couple of points, observations. To, uh, and and I'm the last speaker, so. I want to keep this uh, concise. Um, I'm, I'm going to break my uh, talk into kind of two pieces. One is uh, observations on the chapters in the book. And secondly, I'll also give you an example of something that's been kind of cooking in, in Bangalore and Karnataka in terms of municipal finance and, and connecting it to uh, green, uh, new climate economy and, and kind of green uh, municipal uh, finance and green growth uh, strategy that the state is planning and, and Bangalore's kind of a uh, uh, testing ground for that. So, if I look at the uh, the first chapter I, uh, on, um, uh, we look. We, uh, Ishar was kind enough to send us the uh, the relevant chapters. Uh, the one on uh, uh, the examples from China. I think the the land uh, investment corporation model. Uh, yes, they have tapped into very effectively leveraging and monetizing land, but uh, I think over dependence of it is they are trying to un undo some of those examples. Uh, one of the things that uh, that stood out is uh, yes, it, it provides large returns uh, in a booming economy with really high rates of urbanization, but uh, it's a one-time revenue. I mean, you can monetize it once, and after that, what do you do? And and China is now investing in undoing some of the environmental damages that have happened as a result of these. Maybe it's maybe that's uh, uh, something that we can learn from. Uh, so they're now heavily investing in, in undoing some of the damages that has resulted in this. Secondly, um, but, but what are the lessons for India? I think one of the key is, is to have a consistent uh, budget that goes from the national government to the sub-national governments. Because if these budgets vary year after year after year, it's also difficult for the local governments to plan their finances in terms of what's coming from the state, what's coming from the national governments. So uh, funds transfer from the central need, it's predominantly quite erratic and, and undergo frequent changes of uh, decentralization. So I, I think one is to create the stable kind of uh, flow of uh, resources. On the chapter on Sao Paulo, I think it was, it was absolutely fascinating. I, I, was, uh, I was reading through it and, and uh, one of my professors from Sao Paulo who currently works with the bank and uh, I remember during my college years, he, he was talking about how Sao Paulo has revisited their legal frameworks of metropolitan governance. So it's not a static document. So it, it's constantly tweaked, revised, 
maybe certain hybrids are created. So one thing that came out of, of that was a monitoring evaluation of the functions uh, because this is a larger kind of umbrella uh, uh, framework within which the, the different municipalities operate. Uh, one is, is also the bottom-up approach that really stood out in the chapter because uh, I think the metropolitan area has formed associations of forums within which this larger shell operates. So I think that's a interesting model because I think there are there are great strengths in the democratic process that we have enshrined in our constitution. I think it has to be protected uh, in some ways in terms of the way uh, the functions of metropolitan governance and the financing and the taxation of it. Should they be combined? Should they be separate? Should there be a hybrid or sharing of responsibilities and taxes? So that's that's an that's a good area of the I think that we should do a little more research. Um, there was uh, the chapter on metropolitan infrastructure and capital finance. Um, one thing that that stood out was the PPP a PPP model in infrastructure. Uh, typically, private players are seen to choose sectors such as telecom rather than water supply and infrastructure. But there's a reason for that. Because, uh, uh, I mean, a, a, a good uh, kind of model is the National Highway Authority of India. They have a, have a good track record of managing their roads for the last eight, seven, eight years with private players. So there is a model that is working. So. But, but that's not the case with the other sectors where you really need the private sector uh, to be p actively participating. Uh, so, but some of the challenges that we face in India, subsidized rates, poor incentive frameworks, um, and, uh, and, and private sector is, is expected to come and kind of lift the, the bar, so to speak, but there is no incentive for them to do that. Uh, and uh, just on that, that point, the, the one final comment that I, I thought was uh, was kind of um, informative was to fill the infrastructure gaps. I think metropolitan areas should look to increasingly to increase their efficiency uh, of the existing infrastructure rather than try and invest in new infrastructure. So the opex versus the capex argument. Uh, you know, I think that's a that's a call that these metropolitan areas have to make, and therefore define fiscal responsibilities, reduce subsidies, uh, set efficient tariffs uh, across some of the. Uh, the service deliveries, and uh, um, on the chapter on slum upgrading, I think the uh, some of the key points that I felt uh, should are kind of relevant in India is 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 looking at slum upgradation in the regional scale, which is currently not being looked at. You have to look at uh, uh, you know the the slum redevelopment at a much larger scale because there's these economics of geography that comes in, people, mobility comes in, uh, job skills, there's a social hierarchy in place. So th these are some of the, the key pieces. And secondly, um, land management, uh, planning, and urban poverty in terms of the, what the Rajiv Awas Yojana uh, looks at. And um, the last point on that is the, the financial models for so-called upgrading are still not feasible because uh, even if you upgrade those slum areas, they're not as equally accepted as the, as the other parts of the city because there is a there is a social hierarchy attached with with the land itself. So this is an area that one has to invest. And uh, um, uh, but now let me actually go to uh, this the second part of 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 uh, what I would like to talk is. Uh, uh, the few good things that are happening in Bangalore, and maybe uh, Ravi can also add to it uh, at the end. Um, uh, one thing that Bangalore has seen, and, and Bangalore's had, what, 50% decadal growth in the last. And it sees about 850 people migrate to the city every day, metropolitan area. Uh, it is 800 square kilometers in, in the municipal limits, 8,000 square kilometers in the metropolitan area. It's too big for its, for its own uh, good. Uh, there is some talk of breaking the municipality into smaller municipalities. There is also talk of creating the MPC. It's, it's created, but only for the, to, to, to honor the courts, right? But there is really no intent in terms of budget allocation or representation of the civil society in the, in the MPC or, and the elected representatives in the MPC. Um, one of the things that, that's actually working, working quite closely with, uh, with BMRCL, 
is uh, the phase two and phase three stations of the metro that are being built. Uh, they are now in planning stages. Phase three is uh, maybe in land acquisition stage. So we are also working and we're, we're working with uh, both the metro agency as well as the urban land transport uh, agency at the state. Is one of the few states that has an urban land transport authority, uh, directed urban land transport. It's uh, headed by a very, very eminent uh, IS officer. Metro Sorry? Metro yeah, so this is at the state level. So DULT is at the state level. And uh, we're actually working with them in, in terms of creating what we call a station area plan. It's the first of its kind, and, and Johannes, you, you talked about you know, uh, what Delhi did not do, and Bangalore is, in some ways, the first city to look at two aspects of access uh, across the stations. One is the ability of pedestrians or people who take public transport to get to the metro station and take the metro. So it also <coughs> adds value to the ridership numbers that the metro is kind of projecting 10, 15 years from now. But at the same time, the, the physical ability to get to the metro station is directly impacted by the urban farm around the metro station. If, if, if there is, if the transformation that is bound to happen around the metro station, that is a result of the mass transit coming in, if you do not regulate the transformation, your ability to walk safely on the street is, is kind of diminished. Because everything becomes, because the land value is going up, all residential areas predominantly become non-residential, whether it's commercial, retail, doesn't matter. But as the result of that is parking loads increase, infrastructure carrying capacities reduce. So one thing that we are seeing is the land value capture, and this is something the Bangalore experience is telling us, is the land value capture is directly impacted by the carrying capacity of the existing infrastructure. And if the existing infrastructure can only support up to two FAR, but the the real ridership numbers that are required maybe require a FAR of four, how do you upgrade them? And, and this is a real challenge because you can't dig up all the roads uh, at the same time. There's also the, 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 the labyrinth of different agencies having their different timelines, different budgets. So one thing that, that we're uh, looking at uh, is, is the physical design and the development control regulations around the metro stations. So the DCRs, it's a planning mechanism that is now create, uh, we are trying to create the framework to uh, integrate the DCRs in the master plan document. That's the key. Because unless it's a mandated set of regulations, anybody can go and change the land use and building use. So we're trying to regulate. So, so out of uh, 45 stations in phase one, I think they've already started, 15 stations are already on their way in terms of developing the DCRs developing the physical design, uh, uh, the street design guidelines, so to speak. Uh, the other example that, uh, that's come up quite, uh, and Bangalore's in, a, in some ways a different animal uh, by itself because the civil society is extremely strong in Bangalore. And we have Ravi part of that. Uh, we also have uh, you know, Kiran Majumdar Shah who kind of leads a lot of that. And they're quite vocal, they're very powerful. Uh, and, and in some ways they also bring in a certain level of accountability on the government. Uh, I think that's required. It's missing in some other cities in India. Uh, and the civil society in some ways, in Bangalore, what we call as the, uh, the collective ecosystem of problem solvers. So uh, we've actually created the, that ecosystem of problem solving at a much, so it's almost like creating a parallel government and then converging it with the government. Because you are adding value, you're, you're thinking outside the box. We, but we understand the limitations of how the government functions, and therefore we're, we're bringing in something that actually works. And therefore the government is able to take it on board and implement it to a certain level of completion. So that's one thing that, uh, that I think should be leveraged when we look at infrastructure. Uh, and, and I will, uh, the last uh, point that i like to make is uh, there's an initiative with the like the TNUDF, uh, there's the Karnataka Urban Infrastructure Finance Development Corporation, KUIDFC. They are looking at uh, issuing green city bonds. Uh, the, the difference there is they're looking, uh, and the objective is to support the emergence of financial ar architecture that would create a coalition for green growth and to develop a green city bond program that will help shape the vision and strategy of cities towards new green growth economies. So this is something that uh, Keshav Varma and Tony Pellegrini from the bank